So it doesn't matter how much money I make or save. It's all about my relationship toward that money. Yeah. So I can save a billion dollars and still not have happy money. Yeah, exactly. Nobody in America will believe you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, how many billionaires and millionaires commit suicide? They can buy everything. They can buy anything. But still, they go into uh, drug issues and all that. Money can relieve a lot of stress. Money can save you from misery. Money itself doesn't guarantee happiness. It buys certain freedom. But being free financially is not a guarantee for your happiness because most people feel happy uh, when they're connected with their loved ones. And to be connected with your loved ones, it doesn't require much money. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Crazy Money. This is your host, Paul Ollinger. I hope your new year has gotten off to a great start. I hope your resolutions are producing a uh, more positive, more healthy, more rested you somebody who is appreciating the day, and it is a great day to be alive, as we all know, that is uh, just uh, enjoying life a little bit more than you were maybe at the end of 2021. Maybe you'd lost focus and now you're resolved to pay attention to the things that matter. Maybe you're doing dry January. I've been doing that. That's been, uh, it's been pretty good to reset the batteries. I am finding myself getting a little thirsty. I got to admit, dry January is going to yield definitely not dry February, but better for the experience. Hey, I've got a great conversation to share with you today with Ken Honda. Ken is the author of Happy Money, The Japanese Art of Making Peace with Your Money. And his books have sold over 8 million copies worldwide. On today's show, we're going to talk about how each of us can feel worthy of money, how we can say arigato or thank you to money, how to make money work in our marriages, and how to make peace with our childhood money experiences. That's a lot to tackle in Oh, 44 minutes of conversation, but we're going to do it. Ken's got an interesting background. He was in the professional world, then he retired at age of 29 to welcome his newborn daughter into the world. He thought he was done with work because he had owned a consulting and accounting business, which was so successful. He got to uh, have a little bit of freedom and financial flexibility and spend days with his young daughter. But little did he know that that was going to lead to his second career as a very, very successful global author. And he did so by reflecting on how he could help other people improve their relationship with money. The essays that he started writing while he was watching his young daughter and observing her interacting with the world became Happy Money, the book we discuss today. I know you're going to enjoy this fresh perspective on money all the way from Japan. This, my friends, is Ken Honda. Ken Honda, welcome to Crazy Money. Oh, hi. Ken, you've sold over 7 million books. How did you get started writing? So I had a unique life. I retired at age 29 for my baby girl. And I had a very fortunate four years of changing diapers and focused on just child raising. And during the four years of semi retirement, I had this vision of writing. I thought I went crazy because I was not doing anything. I was doing accounting and consulting. So writing is not my forte. But I had this vision of writing on happiness and money. And I did it anyway. I had all the time in the world. And I distributed my booklets, you know, uh, actually stapled 26 word document to my friends. And my friends loved them. So I hired a printer. And because of the mix of the order, I got 3,000 of my booklets uh -oh. sitting in my living room. My wife said I have about a month to, <laughs> to just to get them away. So... I went crazy giving away my booklets. Okay, you take 100, you take 50. And I got rid of all the boxes in the living room. And uh, a word of mouth, the booklet went so popular, crazy. And the publisher called me and I wrote a book. And since then, I have published more than 200 books and sold over uh, 8 million copies now. What were the first topics that you addressed in that newsletter? What made you think to write those things? You know, I saw a, a mother and a child in a park nearby. The mother was hurrying, so she literally dragged her daughter out, pulled her off from the swing, and she said, your mommy has got to work. I was really shocked. It's because of money, and money stress, our happiness is lost. So I thought if people can figure out how to uh, make money your, your friend, not your enemy, there will be a lot of happier people. 
So I got inspired to write on happiness and money in the hopes that people read my books or my booklet and feel happier about their life and also feel happier about their money. That was my sincere prayer and still is the same after 20 years. Did anybody say to you, well, Ken, it's easy for you to be happy with money because you retired at 29. You have a lot of Mm -hmm. money. So of course you can be happy. But I, I -hmm. have to work hard. I still have bills to pay. Yes, but you have to start from somewhere. And you don't have to be super wealthy to be thankful for money. It's your mental attitude. Uh, One of my students who is a single mom who got paid very little, and she got this idea of thanking the people who give her the money. So she started appreciating her boss. She was complaining about him a lot, and he knew it. Her attitude changed. So the second she started appreciating her boss, he felt the change. So a few weeks later, she got a big raise and also a big bonus, too, for staying with the company for a long time. So this appreciation works. It might take some years, a few years, to shift from the bottom a little bit higher and then toward a place that you're supposed to be. But this appreciation pulls you out from the ditch and then uh, takes you to where you want to be. It doesn't really matter how much you have right now. Now, you write that people have one of two relationships with money, either fear or love. Is respect for money and what it can do for us the place we start working toward love? Yes, uh, you said it so beautifully. I think if you are in love with money, your life would be beautiful. But if you love too much, that's called obsession. Love of money will definitely make you very miserable. So it's a very a little different because if you love too much and you're obsessed with money, you lose happiness. But if you show love to money, uh, respect to the people around you, your life will be happier. Okay, how do I show respect to money? What does that mean? That sounds yeah. like we're treating money like a person. What does that mean? Right, right. I became a student of my mentor. His name is Wahei Takeda who used to be called Warren Buffett of Japan. He passed away at the age 83 a few years ago. One time I had this rare opportunity to talk with him for a few seconds. You know, what would you say or ask Warren Buffett if you had a private time with him for like 30 seconds? And I said, how can I be wealthy? And he said, it's very simple. Just arigato your money. What? Arigato your money? And then I was pushed out. (laughs) And, And later I found out Uh, When money comes into your life, appreciate the money coming into your life. When money leaves you, also appreciate the money for staying with you. So this uh, cycle of appreciation you start would shift your life. Now, you said arigato, your money. For non-Japanese speakers, explain what arigato means. (laughs) Yeah, thank you, money. Uh, It can be any language, you know, danke or sheshe or gracias or merci, uh, whatever the language you choose. Because think about it. People pay you, you know, if you're a coach, there are thousands of other coaches. They chose you. There could be a potential uh, employees, but uh, your company that you're working for chose you. They hired you. So you could have appreciation for your clients, customers, and your boss and companies you're working for. This attitude of appreciation really opens up new opportunities because when you appreciate it, like my student's boss, You know, you feel like you want to give something back to him or her. And the clients are the same thing. I divided my clients when I was doing consulting into two categories. One, I always brought some little small gifts to them whenever I had a chance to explain about their financial situation. And the other, I did nothing. I just just brought my documents, you know. Six months later, I realized that uh, from the group A that I brought small gifts like Japanese tea or a book, something small. They gave me so many referrals. So uh, when you show your appreciation, they show you back. So the more you appreciate your clients, they'll bring in more customers. They become very royal. So this appreciation is not a spiritual something. You know, it's a real thing. It's spiritual in the sense that to think something, to consciously express gratitude to something Mm -hmm. and for something requires you to be conscious of that thing requires you to acknowledge what that thing is and what it can do for you and what it will not do for you if you don't take care of it. Is that right? 
Yeah, so it's almost like a love and a sincerity and royalty. Those things, you cannot see it. So I call it invisible assets. So the people or the company who have a lot of invisible assets, they stay strong, they grow because of the invisible assets. So we have to be careful when we exchange money for. A lot of people try to get the cash or the money in exchange for their trust or their value. So they may be sacrificing their important thing for money. So, and also there are many ways to receive money out of trust. So there are many ways of making money by taking advantage of other people or by making people smile. It's up to you. If there's a way, which path would you choose? And you describe money that is made doing something you love and earned by serving people that you care about as happy money. Yes. And uh, happy money makes you smile when you receive it. So you know it. Like $10 cash put in an envelope of happy birthday card from your grandparents. And, you know, there's a note. uh, You can buy anything you want with the money. And, you know, you smile. Grandpa, you cannot buy so many things with $10. But the fact they care about you touches your heart. It's not just about the amount. You know, uh, you may wish like uh, your grandparents leave you with a $10 million trust fund or something. (laughs) But this, you know, $10 also makes you smile. And if you loved, that's happy money. You talk about receiving gifts with love and gratitude, but some people don't feel that they're worthy to receive love. And also a lot of people don't feel like they're worthy to receive money. I know many people like this. They don't feel like they're worthy to receive money. And when they do get it, they try to get rid of it as fast as possible. (laughs) Yes, that's so true. Unfortunately, money is tied up with your self-worth. That's how people feel so afraid of being judged by how little money uh, you make. It's interesting, but it's cultural though. I've done this with many different people from a different culture, right? Like in Japan, people don't mind asking uh, your friend how much money he or she makes. But we freak out when we ask how many sex we have, you know? So (laughs) sexual thing is more taboo. But somehow in North America, sexual thing is more open. I just once saw my Japanese friend casually asking his co-worker, an American co-worker, you know, with a strong accent, uh, David, how much money do you make a year? You know, and then he got really shocked. So in North America, you don't even ask those things, right? What did David say? David was like, you know, he froze. And he said, uh, I, I can't tell you, you know. <laughs> it's almost like. But I've had sex three times this week. Yeah, he's okay with that. So, and, and then he he's asking, hey, you know, Kenichiro, uh, how many times do you do that? And like, he's like, how dare you do ask? So it's a cultural taboo. So money uh, brings a lot of emotions, you know, shame, guilt, and anxiety. Financially challenged people often struggle with shame. They don't have much, so they always struggle. But also wealthy people, like especially children, of wealthy families, they feel guilt for inheriting a lot of money. So it's natural that we both carry guilt and shame and unworthiness. So we have to heal those money pain in order to have a happier life. So next time you receive money, uh, just remember you have a choice of feeling unworthy or feeling appreciative because the money he or she gave you, there is a reason. You know, they chose you as a massage therapist. They chose you as your coach. They just uh, paid you for something, some kind of services, right? So instead of feeling shame or guilt or unworthiness, you can feel appreciation. Thank you for choosing me. Thank you for for trusting me. I know there is this uneasy feeling and I feel like I'm I'm unworthy about this, but I'll just give it a try and receive with appreciation and see how it feels. And if you can heal the pain of unworthiness, you can receive more. And by just uh, receiving more, you can give more to other people. You and your family can relax and not worry about money. Now, I grew up in a home with six kids, a house with six kids and two parents. My parents were very frugal. My father was from the Depression era. And we always had enough to eat. Our bills were always paid, but there were very few luxuries. And I felt that there was financial stress in my house. 
I grew up thinking someday I'm going to make a lot of money so that I won't stress about money. But guess what? Mm -hmm. I still stress about money. <laughs> Am I living my father's legacy? Am I always going to feel like I have to hold on to money? I think you you seem to be feeling this bond, bonding. Hey, daddy, I'm having the same thing with you. <laughs> you know, we are buddies. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you can do that. And also you can just say, thank you, dad. Thank you, mom, for making a sacrifice for us. Because of your sacrifice, I don't have to worry about money. I'm just standing up on your shoulders. You raise me up. So I'm free from money stress. It's just the energy. So it's not how many bills and how much debt you have. It's how you deal with the money energy. You know, some people feel responsible and shame. Like, for example, people feel burdened. People feel heavy when they have a debt. But I'm just uh, giving you another way to look, take a look at your debt. Debt is a trust placed upon you from a bank or other institutions or friends. They trusted you. You have enough capability to pay back every month. Instead of feeling heavy or burdened, why don't you feel there is love and trust from a bank or your friend? Like they loved you. They trusted you. Uh, they trusted your financial abundance. You can pay back all the loans. Uh, in return for the trust, I will pay you some interest to show my appreciation. So you can change the whole emotional attachment to money. So you don't have to feel stressed about money. When you pay bills, you can appreciate the bill uh, for supporting your electricity, your food, family, and keeping your house warm. So there are many reasons to appreciate about the bills. You may feel stressed about the bills before, but now when you find the bills in the mailbox, like, wow, I got a new bill. You know? <laughs> that would be a, for that. That would be a novel way to, to look at things. Yeah, because you, ha you have no choice. That's true. That's true. But I never felt better in my life than when I paid off all my bills. When I paid off all my loans, and this was a long time before I had a lot of, I didn't have a lot of savings, uh -huh. but the day I paid off my loans, I felt free. I felt mm -hmm. elated. I wasn't in a loving relationship with that debt. Yeah. So think about it. And even though uh, you're free from debt, mm -hmm. you can think back to days. And then if you feel like you weren't burdened, you were loved. Hey, everybody. Paul here. As you already knew, I don't know why I always say that. Anyway, I want to let you know that I've got a great show coming up on February 3rd in Los Angeles at the Venice West. So technically it's in Venice, California on the West side of Los Angeles. And you can get your tickets at thevenicewest.com. The show is February 3rd. 2022. So if you're listening to this anytime in the future, past that 50, 100 years in the future, not only is the show over, but I'm dead. So don't show up. This show that's going to be happening live in just a couple of weeks will feature amazing comics. Amanda Cohen hosting Jeff Rothpan, who's been on The Tonight Show a couple of times doing a guest spot and featuring Mr. Taylor Williamson, who has been on both The Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson and one of the top finishers on America's Got Talent in the history of the show. Come on out. It's going to be a fun night with a lot of old friends, a lot of smart, grown-up comedy. I know you're going to have a great time. If you don't live in L.A. or can't get there, tell your friends who are there. There's a link to the ticket page in the show notes, or you can go to thevenicewest.com. So let's go back to our parents and what we learn from observing our parents. You write about the situation in your home growing up. What did you take away from your father's relationship with his clients and how has that changed as you become your own man? So I was small. I went to a great school. And one day I came home and I saw my father crying. And, you know, I thought Japanese guys don't cry. You know, they're samurai. So I was so super surprised that this guy, perfect guy, was crying like a baby. And my mother took me aside and uh, she told me uh, my father's best friend committed suicide. I knew what it meant. Not only he committed suicide, before doing that, he killed the entire family and then Ugh. committed suicide. It's called family suicide. And I was super shocked because I've never heard anything like that. And, you know, I was in a, living in a bubble. My father was uh, fairly financially comfortable. We had no problem. But later I found out that my father was consulting his best friend that uh, he was suggesting his friend should go file bankruptcy. He already had some money stored for his buddy uh, after he filed bankruptcy. 
my father can loan some money to live for a few months or something to you know rebuild uh, their life. But he's a Japanese guy. Those days, guys don't talk like that, you know. So my father went into a deep depression, regretting, what if I told him that I had the money for you? He felt abandoned by me and all the other buddies. Uh, I left them die, you know, with the family. So this guilt tormented him and he went into depression and drinking. And since then, uh, we had a lot of laughs. We are a musical family, so we used to sing and play. But the music stopped and uh, my father went in deep depression and he got abusive. So I wondered, you know, how money can turn all the families upside down. So I made up my mind uh, when I grew up, I'll make sure my family is safe and I'll take care of my family. That's why I retired for my baby girl to really protect her and my wife from all the potential suffering from money stress. Now, your retirement to take care of your daughter is not in keeping with the traditional role of a man in Japan. Did people think that was odd that you did that? I said my hero is John Lennon. <laughs> so uh, be- long, uh, before that, I had a you know, short hair, nice suit, like an you know, investment banker type of clothing. But after re- retirement, my hair got longer. I said uh, John Lennon is my hero. Uh, my f- Friends and family thought I went crazy, literally. <laughs> like, I mean, when you find out your wife is pregnant, that's the uh, time when you start working hard. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, we found out about my wife's pregnancy. Okay, let's take a few months off was my original thought. But when you take a few months off, you have no motivation to go back. So it took me a year and a two years and a three years. My speaking was getting slower. My friends all worried about me. They told me a little later, but then I snapped back, you know, so I've been writing like crazy. I found a new addiction, healthier one, book writing addiction. The John Lennon song, Watching the Wheels Go Round, Life is What Happens While You're Busy Making Other Plans. And Yes, exactly. That's, that's how I felt when I retired. And uh, 20 years later, a lot of young, young guys are having some time off because of my influence. You know, I sold 8 million books and talking about the joy of being with a family. I'm changing Japanese men and families too. You describe yourself today as a happy little millionaire. What do you mean by that? So I didn't want to be a billionaire. Little millionaire, meaning that you're not super wealthy. You have no financial stress. And you can say whatever you want, no strings attached. You can work or you don't have to work. So I can write or I don't have to write for money. I'm speaking to many uh, different groups. Uh, Sometimes I get paid, sometimes I don't. It's okay because I'm financially independent. So to be in a situation, you don't have to be a billionaire. All you have to do is monetize your gifts and set up a system so you can receive financial rewards. And uh, once again, if you have a simple lifestyle, it doesn't require so much money. Do you ever find yourself wanting more luxuries or do you look at something and say, oh, that would be great to have, and then you catch yourself? How do you manage your desires? Uh, I'm a a more simple person, so I don't need a sports car. You know, I'm driving a five or six-year-old Prius and it's good for me. (laughs) So I'm not into cars. Ken Honda drives a Toyota. (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) I used to have a Honda, but I thought it's too boring. So I thought, yeah, Honda is driving Toyota. There, good. Talk to me about families and marriage or couplehood. Why does money get to be such a big issue for so many couples? In the process of uh, giving family counselings around money, I found that interesting thing that even though we are born and brought up in the same household, your brothers and sisters become different people in terms of money. Some people become spenders. Some people become warriors, holders, money uh, maker. And when I found out about couple, I realized they're usually the opposite side of the, their opposite pattern of money personalities. For example, spender people often end up getting married with a saber type. That means a wife uh, loves spending and her <laughs> husband loves saving. So, I've never heard of such a situation, ever, never. <laughs> so a saver, you know, he wants to save, save, save. So 
She was attracted to the, you know, very secure lifestyle. She thought I could keep spending if my husband keeps making money, <laughs> you know. And uh, from a saver's personality, spender looks gorgeous. You know, they know how to enjoy life. So very attractive. So they get married. But a few years later, they realized that from a spender's perspective, a uh, saver's husband is the most boring guy, <laughs> you know. Hey, he go hey, out. hey. And from saver's world, spend a wife is like a disaster. <laughs> you know, how much money he saves, she spends it in two, two seconds. So you may have seen the couple, they end up getting divorced. And then the same pattern goes. We are attracted to different money personality types. But the same reason that we get married are the reasons to get a divorce. Because spender type cannot stand with a boring lifestyle, even though they are attracted to. So the, they'll probably find moneymaker type. You know, so the husbands who love making money. Comedy and tragedy keeps going. <laughs> so how do you resolve that? You don't want to get divorced. You still love your spouse. But you have these conflicting relationships with money. Yeah. So you have to meet in the middle way. You know, that's what I teach more about Zen style. The spender type tries to get the excitement because they are often uh, brought up by the uh, savers, parents, you know, so they experience a boring feeling in the house. So they want to get out and party and then they feel like I'm alive. Right. And the saver people were often raised by spenders, parents. So they often experience, you know, a lot of uh, money traumas. So if you can share about those experiences in between and they can meet in the middle. What's amazing is that spender wife tends to just spend less and find satisfaction. And the saver guy uh, goes out and party with her. And then when they can meet in the middle, they have a more balanced lifestyle. I was actually trying to write about this recently, trying to say that it's actually good to have those conflicting attitudes in the home. Yes. Because... If both people were, I call them the sheriff, the policeman, if they were both savers, they would never do anything. And they would just watch their money for decades, and then they'd die with a whole bunch of money in the bank that never did any good. Mm -hmm. And if they were both dreamers, then they would only just be out spending money, and then within a few years, they'd be broke, and they couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. So the combination, even though it creates stress, is a positive thing. Yes, it is. You said it right. Uh, combination makes life more interesting, exciting, as long as you appreciate the other part. <laughs> but <laughs> we often blame the other part. You're spending so much money, that's why we are broke. And the other one said, we are having a, such a boring life because of you, <laughs> right? So culturally speaking, what Japanese attitudes or behaviors toward money would Americans be wise to emulate? And what American habits would the Japanese benefit from? This is a fascinating topic because Japanese... Uh, savers. They love to save. They're afraid of taking risks. And Americans, uh, North Americans, from my eyes, uh, they're uh, spenders, you know. <laughs> yes, we are. We are. Tens of reasons. Thanksgiving, Black Friday, you know, <laughs> a party is Christmas. So whatever that is, you know, it's a great excuse. You know, I did a great work, so I deserve to buy things. And the whole marketing geniuses are uh, working wonders and trying to just skim your card legally, right? So if Japanese mentality and American mentality uh, meet in the middle, Japanese should have more fun, should work less, do more parties. And American people learn to save more. There's a statistics. Many families are uh, one or a few paychecks away from bankruptcy. That's not a healthy attitude. We worry about money. If these two cultures learn from one another, I think that'll make a perfect couple. Japan, for the last few decades, has gone through some, some serious economic issues, lack of growth, aging population. How have those situations affected Japanese attitudes toward money? I think uh, Japanese people are very conservative, but still, Japan is one of the wealthiest countries. You know, this now it's the third biggest uh, economic country. So Japanese people enjoying invisible assets more, I think, like uh, what North American and Europe European and other industrious countries don't. It's, for example, it's safety. One of my American friends was super surprised when a five-year-old girl walking to the school alone and, you know, going on the subway alone. 
And it's a common scene in the morning. And if you just uh, let your five-year-old girl, you know, go on the subway in New York or Chicago on her own, you'll be probably arrested or at least like say, you know, yes. you shouldn't do that. That's so right. yeah. it's very safe here. So even though we are not as economically successful, but I think people are still fairly happy with where we are. And uh, there is not a uh, political division either. Most people are not interested in politics. So we don't get heated arguments about uh, which prime minister should win, you know, because I think, oh, okay, the next guy looks the same from the other one. So in that <laughs> sense, I think uh, we are happier people. I've never uh, seen any anybody fight against each other because of politics. We think it's not worth it, you know, so, but it's a cultural thing, so. So it doesn't matter how much money I make or save. It's, mm -hmm. it's all about my relationship toward that money. Yes. So I can save a billion dollars and still not have happy money. Yeah, exactly. Nobody in America will believe you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, how many people, how many billionaires and millionaires commit suicide? They can buy everything. They can buy anything. But still, they go into uh, drug issues and all that. Why is that? Because they're not happy. So... Money can relieve a lot of stress. Money can save you from misery, but that doesn't guarantee. Money itself doesn't guarantee happiness. It buys certain freedom, but being free financially is not a guarantee for your happiness because most people feel happy uh, when they're connected with their loved ones. And to be connected with your loved ones, it doesn't require much money. You need some money, but not billions of dollars. And let's say we are connected with our children and we happen to be in a position for any family with the means that they'll have more than they need when they die. What should you do with that money? How much money should you leave your children? I love the book called Die With Zero. Bill Perkins. I interviewed Bill. I really enjoyed the concept, you know, Die With Zero. What a fascinating uh, idea. Actually, one of my students' mother passed away a few years ago. And before she died, she calculated how much money she's going to need for her funeral and other things. And then she tried to calculate it and she had like three grandchildren. So she donated. She already gave some money, like say a few thousand dollars, and then donated a little money for the charity. And when my student closed her bank account, the account balance was like something like Eight dollars and seventy cents, seventy seven cents, <laughs> and what a beautiful way to die! And so, if you could die like that, it's like you know, uh, in uh, Olympic gymnastics, you kind of roll over and then jump, you know, just jump on. And then, I think uh, she won the gold medal. So many of us die with too much money. How much money is too much money to give to your children, even if you give it to them during their lifetimes? I think it's up to uh, your children. Uh, if they have enough capability of making money, you don't need to leave anything. But if your kids are more artistic type and needs assistance, uh, some money to keep her or his art project going is very helpful. There's no, like, how much money you should have uh, or you should leave your kids. I think what's most important is leave your kids with a sense of love and self-esteem. If he or she loves himself or herself and knows how to survive financially, you did a great job. Is that the money prayer you have for your daughter? Yes. And I think, uh, you know, she's doing music and uh, she'll find enough fans and she'll be loved by everybody. So um, I have a complete trust in her. And after I die, she'll be fine. She will figure out how to, how to make herself happy. Now, Ken, I think I know the answer to this question, but I'm interested to see how you phrase it. Do you feel rich? I don't know if rich is the right word, but I feel happy and abundant. So because one thing is I, I'm debt free. Even if I go bankrupt, I have many ways to come back. Like a joy of bankruptcy. You know, I can make it a national <laughs> bestseller, right? <laughs> How yeah. to survive bankruptcy, you know, <laughs> happy steps to recovery from bankruptcy, you know, 
Or like uh, instead of happy money, my next uh, book will be happy bankruptcy. A lot of people <laughs> can enjoy it, right? <laughs> so I can come up with a uh, many different fun ideas to start from bankruptcy. So I'm not afraid. So in that sense, I think I'm a abundant person. That's great. I'm going to go register the URL, happybankruptcy.com. <laughs> <laughs> you know, crazy money idea is sort of like the same thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, happy bankruptcy is a little a little better, a little tighter. <laughs> Ken, this has been a really great conversation, and I appreciate you sharing your thoughts with the world. How can our audience find out more about you? Thank you, Paul. I really enjoy having a chat with you. Uh, you can find all the information at KenHonda.com. And uh, I have one of the largest online salons in Japan, and I've created an English-speaking online salon. 20 nationality, different countries are joining. I meet every month. So if you're interested in learning uh, about happy money with me or with us, uh, join Arigato Living Community. Uh, we're just exchanging ideas and how to appreciate one another. I think we need to support each other from now. That is a way to have a beautiful life. You can find all the information in that kenhonda.com, I have a lot of free content to figure out your money personality types too. That is great. The name of the book is Happy Money by my guest, Ken Honda. Ken, it's been a pleasure. Domo arigato. Domo arigato. Thank you so much. A lot of happy money will pour into you. I thank you for that blessing. Wow, that was a really interesting conversation. And as I think about my takeaways for this week, I can't help but once again reflect on the connective power of podcasting not only do I get to connect with you, the audience, if mostly one way, but many times I get to hear from you and I'm always grateful to hear from you, Paul at crazymoneypodcast.com or connect with me on the Crazy Money Listeners Group on Facebook. I'm always glad to hear from you, always glad to hear feedback from you, good ideas, tell me what you think about the guests, about the insights, et cetera. But the connective power of podcasting to other people that I've gotten to know over the last three years has been incredibly enriching to my life. It's made it more interesting. It's helped me to continue to grow in a time where I don't have a traditional corporate job as a means to go out there and continue to network and expand my horizons. So this has been a great experience and I'm most grateful to Ken and all the guests who have made themselves available to share their wisdom and their knowledge and their lives with me. Secondly, Thank your mom and dad. You know, I'm from a, a from big Catholic family. We had everything we needed, but it was a little bit strapped. And I don't want to overemphasize the financial stress in our house. It was just sort of always there bubbling underneath. It wasn't like crisis. And there's so many people that do live in that way that I don't want to minimize their plight and say that I experienced it. I didn't. And my mother and father gave me everything I ever needed, including a college education with no debt. When we know how rare a privilege that is these days. But he also afterwards allowed me to go off and figure out adulthood on my own with very limited help along the way. And that was a huge gift to me. If it left me a little bit uh, overly passionate, shall we say, about the importance of, of using money wisely. But I think the thing that those of us with a little bit more or a lot more than the typical middle class family is we're going to have to strike the balance between providing for our kids in the way we want to and giving them the opportunity to find themselves and prove to themselves that they have the opportunity to make it on their own, to quote the theme song of the Mary Tyler Moore show, for those of you over 50. And by the way, next I'm not done with my takeaways yet, but next week's guest, Julie Lithcott Hames, she has three books, but the two we're going to talk about is Your Turn, How to Be an Adult, and the other one is How to Raise an Adult, which is all about what we can do as parents to turn our kids into responsible, autonomous, self-sufficient human beings. Julie is a badass, and I really enjoyed her books, and I know you will love her as a guest. That's next week, Julie lithcott Haim. so tune in for that. But before I go, one more takeaway, heal the pain of unworthiness and more will come your way. I believe deep down inside, and one of the reasons I've wanted to do the podcast was because I believe all of us are worthy of earning a decent living. I believe that all of us, if we are willing to work hard and bring our best selves to a workplace that we have the opportunity to be paid well for our time. That doesn't mean all of us are going to get rich, but I see especially a lot of younger people in, in the comedy industry that a lot of people just don't believe they're worth making more than minimum wage or even going out there and fighting for minimum wage as a starting point beyond which to earn 
much, much more money. And I think that's a plight. I think that is a widespread condition in our society. And I would love to see Ken's quest that if we can heal the pain of unworthiness, we will see more money come our way because I believe it's really important and I believe it's 100% possible for almost everybody. All right, that's it for this week. Thanks for sticking around to the end. Next week, Julie lithcott Hames, tune back in. You will not be disappointed. In the meantime, Mike Carano, make me sound smart.